Hey man, you want to make a video intro together? Hmm, I don't know man. Together? Yeah bro, like, together. Like, co-create the video together? Yeah, we can like, co-create the vid. You know, call it like, COVID or something. We'll make it together. <laughs> yeah, COVID. <laughs> That's pretty good, never heard of that before. Yeah man, let's coin that term, and once our video hits it big, everybody will be using it. It'll spread across the world and everyone will be talking about it. Sounds good to me, bro. Let's make it. What's the video about again? Um, diseases and pathogens. Perfect. Everyone gets sick, and when you do, it really isn't fun. Exploring how sickness works is an important part of biology, as it provides information on how we can take action to fight sickness-causing invaders on an individual and population level. The focus of this video is around infectious disease, which means some other thing, like another organism, is causing a disease, specifically in humans for our scope. We call these disease-causing organisms pathogens. And they can come in many forms like bacteria, viruses, fungi, and protists. Other organisms classified as archaea are not known to cause any diseases among humans. These organisms can differ in which species they impact along with how they disrupt their host. Some can cause infections in both humans and other organisms while others only impact specific animals that are not humans, like farm animals. And of course others can impact specific plants as well. We should try to take every precaution in keeping these invaders out as much as possible, as they can cause nothing but trouble to our overall health. Okay, so keeping pathogens out is our first goal, and humans do this with a very important organ called skin, which is its own body system called the integumentary system. The skin and its associated mucous membranes are the first line of defense that our body has against pathogens. If we can keep the pathogens out, there is no way they can harm us. Unfortunately, this is not always the case, as we'll get into on the next few slides. For now, we need to know that this first line of defense, aka the skin, acts as both a physical barrier and a chemical barrier. The physical barrier is simply the cells that make up the layers of the skin, which include the epidermis, the outer layer, and the dermis, the inner layer. These layers physically block any pathogens from entering the body. In addition to the layers of the skin, the integumentary system also secretes different mucous membranes at sensitive parts of the body that need additional protection. These locations include the nasal passages, trachea, urethra, and vagina. The mucus that is secreted at these locations captures foreign pathogens, preventing them from reaching any internal cells that they could potentially infect. Some of these locations, like the trachea, are lined with specialized cells that contain cilia, which are hair-like projections off of the apical surface of the cells that move in a wave-like motion to carry pathogens back out of the body to be released via the mucus secretion. All of this together makes up the first line of defense the body has against pathogens. The skin does a great job of protecting our body, but not when the defense line is broken. If skin is cut, blood vessels are exposed to the outside environment, which gives pathogens an opportunity to invade. However, our body has a very important clotting system that works to prevent blood loss and close off the opening to prevent pathogen entry. When a blood vessel is damaged, platelets move to the site and form a temporary plug with red blood cells. The platelets then release clotting factors that set off a chain of reactions. Clotting factors trigger the conversion of the inactive molecule prothrombin into an activated enzyme called thrombin. Thrombin then converts fibrinogen into fibrin, which creates a mesh of strands around the open area that catches more platelets and blood cells, ultimately sealing up the wound. The exterior surface of the original blood cells and platelets will eventually harden and form a scab. The skin will continue to heal over time and the scab will fall off when it's no longer needed to seal the wound. Don't pick that scab because it could reopen the cut and the process will have to start again. The first line of defense keeps pathogens out, but as we know, that can fail. So when pathogens do enter the body, there are two different types of immune defense that the body has to fight them, and they are called innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity is classified as our second line of defense, and if it doesn't work, our third line and last line of defense is adaptive immunity. We will discuss both of these in a bit more detail on the next few slides, but for now, let's look at the broad differences between the two. 
Innate immunity is a type of non-specific immunity that every human is born with. With innate immunity, specific cells are programmed to determine what cells are part of our body and what are invaders. If they find something that does not belong, they respond by killing it and removing it. It doesn't matter what type of thing they find, as they can't tell the difference between species of bacteria or types of bacteria, they simply just identify something as foreign and destroy it. Adaptive immunity is the opposite in the sense that the cells within the adaptive immune system have the ability to fight infections in a very specific way. They can, for example, identify a specific type of bacteria that has invaded the body and create a system to identify and destroy only that specific species of bacteria. They basically seek and destroy in a specific way where the innate immune system just destroys anything it comes across. Let's dive into detail about how these work. Phagocytes are one type of specialized cell that works within the innate immune system. They have the ability to interpret whether a cell is an invader or not by the presence of specific antigens, which are specific structural components that extend from the cell membranes of just about everything. Healthy cells, bacteria, viruses, tumors, you name it, and are used for communication. If the antigen is interpreted as something foreign, the phagocyte will engulf the pathogen via the process of endocytosis. This process involves having the pathogen enter the phagocyte by being wrapped up in a piece of the cell membrane. From there, it can be chemically broken down by enzymes from lysosomes so it can no longer cause harm to any other cells. Phagocytes, like other leukocytes, which are white blood cells, are able to effectively capture pathogens by getting to sites of infection quickly because they have the ability to use amoeboid movement. This allows them to extend their plasma membrane through tiny spaces and then have their other internal components follow. This is how they can escape the bloodstream, by squeezing through cells that make up a capillary in order to leave the blood and get to the site of infection. If you were to, let's say, cut your skin. Many phagocyte cells are found where blood is clotting to clean up any pathogens that have entered via the skin breaking. If a pathogen gets past the first and second line of defense, it will start to travel through the body, infect cells, and replicate. At this point, the random phagocyte catch-all method is not effective. Instead, different types of immune system cells, called lymphocytes, start the adaptive immune process, our third line of defense. There are two main types of lymphocytes at play in this process, which are T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. These names are commonly abbreviated to T-cells and B-cells. We are going to break down how these cells work in great detail on the next few slides, but for a brief overview, we need to know that B-cells create specific proteins called antibodies. These antibodies are unique and can help the body identify a specific pathogen to be destroyed. T-cells are communicating cells that can activate B-cells. They have the ability to recognize that a pathogen is present and then communicate that to the B cells to make the antibodies that target each pathogen to be destroyed. Let's dive into the details of how this works. As we mentioned before, this adaptive immune process always starts with antigens. Let's go over what an antigen is in more detail and why they are important. We mentioned that antigens are structures that are found on cell membranes. They can take many different forms, like proteins, sugars, lipids, or nucleic acids. And between those forms, there are variations that make them unique. These antigens are found within the cell membranes of many structures, like our normal human cells, bacteria cells, and viruses. They are used for communication and identification, and are read by other cells, like T cells, to keep our body safe, making sure that only our cells are present, which is information they can get from the antigen. A great example of how antigens are used is on our red blood cells. Red blood cells have specific antigens that give you your blood type. So if a person is blood type A, it means they have A antigens on their red blood cells, type B has B antigens, Type AB has both A and B antigens, and type O is neither A nor B distinguishing antigens. This is important for how your body can recognize and communicate the type of blood that is supposed to be there, because the antigen present is the opposite of the blood type antibodies you have in your bloodstream. These antibodies work to connect to the antigens to mark the blood as being foreign. So for example, if you have blood type A, it means that you have A antigens in your blood cells and B antibodies floating around in your bloodstream. 
Let's say that you were in an accident and needed a blood transfusion, and they gave you blood from somebody who is blood type B. That would not work. The B blood that you were given has B antigens, and the B antibodies already in your bloodstream would connect to those antigens, making the blood cells unusable for delivering oxygen. They would agglutinate or bunch up, causing problems with blood flow. So, because of this rule, if you have type A blood and need additional blood from a donor, you could only receive it from someone who is type A or type O because types B and AB possesses the B antigen that will aggregate or clump up with your B antibodies. In addition to the AB antigens, your blood type can also be negative or positive. This is due to an additional antigen found on the cell membrane of red blood cells called the RH group. If you are positive, it means you have the RH antigen. If you are negative, it means you do not have the RH antigen, but you do have the RH antibodies. The same logic applies here with donating blood with RH factors. You cannot give the RH antigen to a person who has the RH antibodies. All right, so we know what antigens are. Let's get back to more details about the adaptive immune system. Remember that the adaptive immune system fights specific infections using T cells, B cells, and antibodies. The first step of this process is T cell activation. This process starts with a phagocyte that has destroyed a pathogen as discussed before. When the pathogen is destroyed, that phagocyte can take the antigens that were on the pathogen and present them as antigens on their own cell membrane. We call this type of cell an antigen-presenting cell. It's basically saying, hey, I just killed this thing that was not supposed to be here, and this is what it was, just so all of you other cells know. A T lymphocyte can then come along and read that antigen, and if it interprets it as being a foreign substance, which in this case it will, it becomes activated. An activated T cell replicates and links up with a B cell, which leads us to the next step that we will continue on the next slide. When a T cell becomes activated by the antigen presenting cell, it can link up with a specific B cell and create chemical messages called cytokines. These cytokines will then activate specific B cells to replicate and become plasma cells that produce antibodies. These antibodies will specifically connect to the antigen from the pathogen that was presented by the original phagocyte. The significance here is that when the antibodies connect to the pathogen via the antigen, it makes them easily recognizable to our other body cells that will destroy them, meaning they can be eliminated relatively quickly because they are marked for destruction. If a different pathogen were to enter with a different antigen, this process would happen again and ultimately activate a different B cell, one that creates the correct antibody for the new pathogen. Okay, so your body used adaptive immunity to destroy a pathogen. Nice work. But what happens next? Eventually, the immune system will subside and the B cells will stop creating antibodies as they are no longer needed. In addition to that, something else happens with T cells and B cells that is pretty cool. During the initial response to the pathogen, some of the activated lymphocytes will develop into memory T cells and memory B cells. They do not actively signal or produce antibodies during the initial infection, which we call the primary immune response, but instead wait around and persist even when that infection has been dealt with. They continue to sit in a dormant state in case that same pathogen makes its way into your body again at a later time. And if that happens, we call it a secondary immune response, and this time, because you have those memory cells ready to immediately activate and create antibodies, the response is much faster. Looking at this graph will show us the relative response times for primary versus secondary immune response. The primary response usually takes longer because this is the first time your body is seeing that pathogen, and it takes time to figure out and build up the correct antibodies. This is often when you are feeling pretty sick, with a cold let's say, because your body is figuring out how to fight it. During the second response to the same pathogen, your body already knows how to fight it, so you might not even feel sick at all as your body takes care of it quickly. But as you know, pathogens like the flu and the common cold evolve and change every year. So your body has to go through its primary immune response over and over to re-strengthen the system. Which is unfortunate for us because it can knock us down for a week or so as we feel sick and need to recover.